break. Hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the next edition of, the next edition, this edition of um, the, the uh, Elder Law Seminar that I do here in conjunction with the Marlboro Council on Aging. My name is Arthur Bergeron. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Um, I've, I've done this before. There were 55 of us. There were a lot of lawyers. I do Elder Law. Uh, and the goal of the presentations that I've, been, I've tried to do over the years has really been to give folks a sense of, yeah, there are, there's a piece of this that is the law, but more broadly of kind of, you know, like, you know, everything you have to know as a person who is getting older. Uh, one of the nice things about the folks that I deal with, elder law clients, is they all know they're going to die. You know, your kids don't know that. You know that, you know. And, and so one of the issues that occasionally comes up is what happens to your body after you die, an area where typically lawyers don't talk to you very much because they want to talk about the estate and mass health and all this other stuff. So we decided we would, we would get the great what happens after you die couple, right, Regina and Alan Slattery from the Slattery Funeral Home, to help discuss this matter. Um, we're going to talk about our old, you remember our old friends, Frank and Mary? and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Jr., and we always talk about them and their various trials and tribulations, and Frank and Mary's goal is to live in the house until they die and they want to be buried in the backyard, right? And typically, after that, after we've talked about Frank and Mary, we just talk about Mary, because Frank has died, and you know, what does Mary do? Well, today, we're going to talk about Frank. Frank's dead, and he's, and, and we're going to, first of all, the question is, can he be, he can actually be buried in the backyard? That's kind of like a related question. So we're going to talk about a set of issues regarding what happens to Frank's body, right? And by the way, typically in these presentations, we've done the whole presentation, and then we've taken questions at the end, but we're not going to do that for this one, because we're really going to take this kind of air, topic by topic, or area by area, and talk about these kinds of questions, and actually, or, or these issues, and then take questions. So, uh, who controls your body uh, after you die, right? So I guess my first question is, has this come up? Does this, does this issue, do you ever get arguments with, it, with folks, you know, after someone has died and they're dealing with this? Not usually. Not usually. Not, not usually. Ever? Has there been any bad? Time? Has there ever been a only if a, a person is in the nursing home, yeah. has no relatives, yeah. and um, there's a, been a guardian appointed? And there's been a guardian appointed. And in that case, there's sometimes an issue. There's an issue. Right? So I'm going to talk about this a little bit, because because the, the, the interesting thing about this issue, about who controls your remains after you die, is that there, there until very, very recently, there was no statute on this at all. Right? This was purely a matter of case law. And the way the case law worked was that if you died, your spouse had control of your remains. Um, and if they couldn't find the spouse, or if the spouse was dead, right, then your children had control of your remains. But there was no like order in which to figure out who's, who, which of your children's controlled your remains. So that if there was a disagreement among the kids, right, there was a real problem. Right? Because there really is no way to figure out if two different people have different senses of what happens to the remains. Right? That actually, interesting, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we talk about organ donations, but that, there is actually a remedy for this now, and I want you to note this. Um, the Uniform Probate Code, which was adopted by, the, the, by Massachusetts just a couple of years ago. For, for years we had this kind of evolving rule of probate, which has gone on for like 200 years got dramatically changed. A couple of years ago, we adopted basically a form of a universal system of probate law, which has been adopted in many other states. And there's this bizarre little provision of it called Chapter 190, Capital B, Section 3-701. These are the kinds of things that lawyers are supposed to know. Um, and what that provision says is that if you have left instructions to your um, what they're now called personal representatives. They used to be called executors or administrators. If you have left instructions to your personal representative uh, in writing, either in the will 
uh, or in a separate document. Can be either one. Your um, personal representative may, does not have to, but may abide by those instructions regarding what happens to your remains. So you now actually do have a way now of, of specifying, of saying um, who, who, how your remains are going to be handled. And I think that that's going to be relevant regarding kind of what some of these possibilities are. I remember, well, see, I actually had one where there was a disagreement. I remember it was somebody in Hudson. Never, this would never happen in Marlboro, you know, but in, in Hudson, there was actually a disagreement between the children of the deceased and the second wife, right? Oh, yeah, because the children never liked the second wife. And so the children had told uh, Tommy Hamilton over in Hudson, uh, we don't want the, 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 new, the second wife at the funeral, right? I represented the, that person, right? And she called me all distraught, of course. You know, what do I do? What do I do? The first time I ever had to look any of this stuff up and actually found the case that said the spouse is in control. So I said, don't worry. And I actually called Tommy Hamilton. I said, let the kids know that actually if there's an issue, they can't go to the wake, right? Only my client's going to go to the wake, right? Because she would actually have had the ability to do that, right? Because she has the control of the remains and therefore of kind of how the ceremony works. So if, you, if there's a concern about this, then that's how it works. So we're going to just talk, now we're going to talk about the other interesting question, which always comes up, right? So what happens if you did one of those little cards, you know, that you got in your wallet and it's on your license and it says you donated your organs or something and then you die. So then what happens? Um, well, it, it depends where you die. It depends it, it, it's where you, you die. die. This sounds like a lawyer talk, right? <laughs> well, it, well, if it you does. die in New it Hampshire, does. there's a different set of rules. No, well, well, it, yeah. well it is, because if you die in the hospital, the hospital is required to call the donor bank and um, speak and speak to the um, family representative who is going to be in charge of, of the remains. If it's a nursing home, it would be then up to the family to notify the donor bank if they knew. Yep. And the yep. same with um, uh, at home death. And what's the donor bank? The donor bank is in Waltham, Massachusetts. It's the regional office where they harvest the um, organs, yep. tissue, long bone, so and, really and whatever. So like a there, there, place, is a, right? there is a genuine place. Okay. And so you, the, and the remains you, would go there. The remains would go, go there. there. And, yep. who they gets, would, and who gets the remains there? Um, the, the donor bank would, would pick them up at the place of death, bring them to their facility, um, do the harvesting, and then it would be the funeral home that would pick up the remains. I see. So I was I always, you know, I always thought you donate like your kidney, you know, or you donate like a particular thing to the donor bank, and, and, and that's what's, no. No. How, how, does, that, how does that all work? It, if Once you sign that donor card, yep. they can harvest whatever they want to harvest. So they can do eye nucleation, long bone, tissue, um, organ. They can do, they, you can pretty much take, kind of take what they want. Exactly. Now, can you control that through that, the donor, the document? It's my understanding that you can't. That you cannot? No. Okay, so that, so that, so that there are some real issues. So, yeah. your, so your body gets picked up, and, 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 and does the donor bank always take the body? Or does the donor bank um, ever Sometimes just say, it's rejected. Nah. Yeah, it, sometimes. it can be rejected. And I know one issue that comes up that I've you know, heard people talk about is, is, oh, you know, they'd never want that body. I mean, my body. I mean, I'm really old. You know, I mean, you know, what could they use in this body? Have you found that the donor bank really only wants young people who have died? As, you know? Not necessarily. No. Not necessarily. So it's really varied. It, it varies. It depends upon what they died from. What yeah. their age group is and exactly what they might be looking for at the time. I see. So the donor bank may be actually looking for something that you have that is like very special, mm -hmm. right? So who, who, who knows? And, and, and then when the, the, the remains come back, what does that, what's typically, how long does that all take to happen, right? So you die, because obviously the issue is we don't want to have to be postponing the funeral so that yeah. we can be dealing with these issues. Right? Die at 8 o'clock in the morning, you're probably back to the funeral home by 5, 6 o'clock that evening. If you die that in the morning, you're probably, your remains are probably back in the funeral home by that evening, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of how the donor bank stuff works, right? Yeah. And, and 
So, and so now we're going to stay here for just a second because in the course of doing this presentation, I also learned these new things, right? I, so that's why I love doing these because it forces me to learn pieces of the law that I had never idea. So I ended up reading the donor statute regarding how all of this works um, and found out that two years ago it was revised. The donor statute was revised in a very significant way. Right? Actually, a couple of very significant ways. First, the donor statute had said that your body could be, or your, your parts of your body could be harvested. I always love that term, could be harvested, right? Um, if you had signed one of these donor cards. And it is my understanding that a lot of times what they are looking for are, is tissue as opposed to a particular organ. Um, and it could be used, and the tissue could be used for a whole variety of things. It could be used on some, with someone else's body if they need a transplant, could be used for? Um, well, tissue is either long bone, being your, your bone, yeah. or your actual skin, mm -hmm. oh, the so skin. Tissue, bone is called tissue? Yeah. Tissue, yes. Yeah. And so they could be using it for a whole variety of different Correct. things. Correct, right. transplant. So it could be a transplant. So the interesting thing is, the way the statute now reads is that if when you die, uh, if the if the uh, if the organ bank wants your body, they can get it unless you have actually signed a refusal and said you don't want your body to be going to the donor bank. So if you have said nothing, right, and the donor bank gets contacted by whoever is in charge of your remains, um, that they, they can give your body to them to the donor bank, right? I just mentioned that because, once again, personally, I think these donor banks, it's a wonderful thing. You know, I think it's wonderful that, that we actually have the ability to give something um, that's going to keep on living, literally, um, if we die. But if you are concerned about this, once again, you, you need to understand that you need to actually execute a refusal. Um, otherwise, your body may get donated. Now, here's the other interesting thing that this has pointed out in the statute. Yeah. Your, bod your body can't be donated, but your tissue can. Your body cannot be donated, but your tissue can. Right, because that's two, two different things, anatomical donation and tissue donations. So only your tissue can be donated, but the tissue includes your bones and your... So what can't be donated? Your entire body cannot be donated unless you're going to do an anatomical donation. I see. I see. So that's very interesting. That's an interesting distinction, right? So the other interesting piece is that your health, the, that the, there is actually a priority list that is established in the new statute. The number one person on that priority list uh, who can give your body away uh, is the person who is your health care proxy. Amazingly enough, until I read that statute, I had thought that all powers of the healthcare proxy, like all the powers of a power of attorney, die at your death. This is the one and only exception, right? That following your death, your proxy is the first in line, and therefore I gather the first person that they would contact, right, who has the ability to give your tissue th things about you that are now, you thought, dead <laughs> away, right? That's first. Second is your personal representative under your will because once again your personal representative who we now know has the ability if they want to to give your remains away, right? Um, th that personal representative also can, you know, can do that. And then third would be your spouse and then next would be your children, right? So just be aware of how that works. Any questions on any of that? Yes, sir. The question is, can that proxy donate your tissue if you have not signed an previously an approval? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. That's, that's the point. That under the new statute, your body can be donated unless you have done a refusal saying your body cannot be donated, right? And by the way, that does remind me, though, of an interesting... Uh, I keep on using the word tissue and not body. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. I have to keep using the word tissue and not body. Your tissue can be donated uh, on your behalf for you unless you have actually done a refusal prohibiting that. And, and your proxy is, your first in, is the first in line, unless, that reminds me, the statute also says you can, in your proxy, specifically prohibit your um, name, your, the agent that you name in your proxy from giving your tissue or other things away, right? 
But if you haven't, they have the ability to do it. 35 years ago, you signed one of those cards. Um, and are you, are you in, a, in, a, in a bank someplace? And how can you check? Hold on for a second. Alan, if you did, could just stand just so that Okay. Did, did you sign with the registry of motor vehicles? Yeah. Um, then yes, it would be at, with the organ bank. Right. So if you, you specified just your eyes, then they would only take your eyes. You specified gender. Yeah, I, I, it, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll tell you. Hey, Hazel, you may, you may not want to know, but if you want, we'll find out. If, you, if you'd like, talk to me afterwards, just to remind me, and we'll, we'll find that out. But, re, but remember today, remember today, the rule is, if you haven't specifically excluded it, right, your whole bot, everything is in play. Everything is in play, unless you've done an exclusion. It's the reverse of what it used to be, right? Um, I think it was, yeah, yeah, ma'am, and then you, sir. Yes, I keep doing that. Yes, sir. How do you refuse? Do you put it in your will? The question is, how do you refuse? It can be, it just has to be a writing. It has to be a writing. However, and it, it appeared to me from, the, from, from looking at the statute that the, that the writing needs to be, or, or should be, actually recorded in this registry. It looks like, because it, 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 in this, there's, once again, there's a statewide registry, a kind of an organ donor registry, right, in which you can note that you have said that you do not want your body to be donated. Because otherwise, remember, if you haven't, in general, if, if it's the hospital where you die or if it's a nursing home, and actually the statute refers to firemen and policemen and EMTs too. If any of those folks happen to end up with your body, they're supposed to call. Uh, and find out whether you're on the list. And if the registry indicates and, and, or, or, tells, or tells the organ bank that you have died, and then the organ bank can contact someone, right? And I would bet, although I haven't checked with the organ, I'm actually going to go to this place. I have to see this place now. To, I'm going to go to Waltham, right? And I'm going to see if I can do one of those Bergeron brief shows and actually do a show and, and interview somebody there. Because I want to see whether there's actually a list that shows these exclusions now of people who don't want their organs donated. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, Melissa, you're saying your experience with them was positive and that they actually came back to you, I, I would assume, after, they, after the... Yeah. So, so, so your experience was they called you and said, said the things that they wanted to take. Had, had, had your husband had his name on a donor card for, I see, so they actually cleared it with you. That's great. So you didn't even know that he had a donor card, but, but it was all in the registry. It was in the registry. Thank you. I thought there was a question. Yes, ma'am, and then you, ma'am, and then, then back there. Yes, ma'am. The question is, you signed, with, signed up with the Department of Motor Vehicles or the Registry of Motor Vehicles a number of years ago. Where do the organs go? Uh, to the donor bank. Where? To the donor bank. To this, to this organ bank. As long as they accept them. The hospital always notifies the donor bank. And you, and you cannot. Whether you, have, whether, you, whether, you have a don, whether you have a donor card or not, the hospital is going to call the donor bank. And then the hospital will not release the body until the family has talked to the donor bank. And that sometimes is confusing because we had a situation just recently where the woman died in the hospital the donor bank had called the son three or four times. He could see on the phone that it was the donor bank. He didn't want to talk to them because he didn't know that this was the procedure. And he just put it off and off and off. By the time we saw him, we were not able to pick her up because he hadn't contacted the donor bank yet. So, of course, that was the first thing he did was call them and tell them, no, he was not interested to do that. So the hospital is going to call the donor bank whether you have a card or not. And then the donor bank will call the family. Okay. Yeah. And once again, one of the reasons for that, right, is that contrary to the old law, even if there's no card, the donor bank can 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 ask the folks who are in charge of your remains to 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 let them to let them have the body, right? Because the law has been reversed, it's assumed now that remains are available, and the body's not going to get released by the hospital until the donor bank says it's okay, right? So yes, ma'am. Question is, can you call somewhere to find out? Call the donor bank. And I apologize that I don't have the number. It's the New England Donor Bank, and it's... Okay. So, 
So what you're talking about is anatomical donation, donating your entire body. That would be through a medical school. Yes, you pre-register, you, pre you, you decide which uh, medical school you want to go to. UMass, Harvard, or Tufts. Is there an age cutoff for donations? No. No. That's right. There's no age, no age limit, up or down, up or down, right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I thought, oh, I thought you did. Okay, then I'm going to go back here and then there. Yes, ma'am. Question is, what happens if you die out of state? Do we know? Sorry, sorry, I don't have a, an answer for that. I don't know. If you if you give me your contact information afterwards, we'll get you that answer. We don't. We're that we're we're stumbled by that one. That's why we love doing these. Uh, um, um, <laughs> oh, I see several. Um, Yes, sir, and then you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, it, does this make organ donation cards obsolete? No. No. I think it makes, I think that the new statute makes the card do, by the way, I was, I, I got, I found this in preparation for a presentation we did over in Hudson last week, and then I mentioned it to the other lawyers in the office, and nobody knew this, right? I've n I had never heard this from anybody before, right? That there had been this kind of s switch in the statute, right? And that is my sense. Right, is that it makes them, it makes it, but that's another reason why I'd like to go interview somebody at the organ bank to clear that up, to see if there is still a reason to be actually saying affirmatively you want to donate, as opposed to if you really don't want to donate, you know, doing the necessary paperwork for that. Okay. So, the, so the, the, the question is, is it important, therefore, that if you have a health care proxy, that, the that your doctor or your hospital have it? And the answer is going to be yes, definitely. Because if you have, because the question would be otherwise, how does the organ bank know? that there is a proxy, right? And, and so it's absolutely right, absolutely right. Uh, Mr. Lincoln, and then we're, gonna, then we're gonna stop and we're gonna take further questions if we have time at the end, yes. Question is, is there a fee for doing any of this, the organ bank stuff? My understanding is absolutely not. No, never, no fees, no fees. The, one of the few things the state will give you for free. Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that terrific? So, we, obviously an interesting topic. Um, and now, but then the question is, so if you, if you have died, so what do you do? What do you, what, what about, what are the kinds of instructions that would be appropriate uh, to give to either to the person whom you've named um, in, your, in your will, right? So, and remember, by the way, once again, the only person who's, um, no, that's not true. You could, you could give instructions also to your children if you had decided to not name anybody as the personal representative in your will. You should note, though, and that's true, if you've given the instructions to your children, then the personal representative would simply be out of the picture and your children would simply take care of this. But the question would be, so what kind of instructions should you kind of include if you were giving instructions? And, and I'm interested from the perspective of the funeral home, are often the instructions left there? Can we just kind of, can you just talk about how all of that works? Which one of the team? Uh, Alan is pointing to Regi Regina. Um, you can actually tell the funeral home any, anything you want. You can what you want to wear. We had a woman, she had a glass eye, and her instruction was absolutely positively give, put that eye back in. I don't want them, because her kids would probably have not done that, and she wanted that. I want my glasses on. I don't want my glasses on. Um, I want... Roses, I don't want roses, what, whatever. It makes no difference. Whatever your preference is and whatever you want to have is what you should put down at the funeral home. If you make your prearrangement and you want something specific, make sure that you tell them at the time. They'll write it in, and I'm sure that they will honor it, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and, and what do, else? Do most people do prearrangements? Many people do prearrangements, especially nowadays where people, if they go into the nursing home, they need to have a spend down, and that's one of the things that you don't want your kids to have to pay for if you have the money to pay for it at this point. Um, you come to the funeral home, sit down, decide what you want, and you can pay for it up front. That money goes and it sits in a trust until the time of your death, and that's pretty much how it works. And, and, what it, and, and, and we're going to talk some more about the prearrangement stuff and kind of how that how that works, but, I, but I, I know that, I think when I was talking to Alan, you had talked about the fact that basically if people come in to talk about their various funeral arrangements, you're like required even to have this big long list and you kind of talk about each kind of different aspect of the, of the, of the funeral. Can you just kind of talk about that and kind of the, the list and what's there and what's not on the, if there's anything that's not on the list?
There's nothing that's not on the. Okay. Yeah, there are certain. There are going to be certain. Um, uh, there's certain information that we're going to need for the death certificate, so we do have a form that we fill out, um, and that that is important. And then from there, it's whatever they want to um, add to that. The information that you're going to need, need for, the, for death the death certificate. So, so do, do you actually do the applications for the death certificate? Yes. Oh. So what is it? And, and you file that with right with the city with the city clerk's office. Board of Health, and then the city clerk's office. I see. I see. And, and does the does the city clerk issue the death certificate or the board okay. of health? Uh, the doctor issues the, the certificate. So he'll give us the certificate with the cause of death, his signature. Then it's our our uh, job to fill in person's name, date of birth, their parents' names, their places of birth, social security number, the informant who gave us this information, where the disposition is going to take place, the date of the disposition and then the signature of the Board of Health and then the uh, city clerk's office. Okay, city and clerk's. then you bring that down to the city, city clerk's clerk. office? Yep. Now that's something I never knew. Yes, yes ma'am. And, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the answer to that question and then we're gonna hold other questions regarding prepay, prepay until a little bit later on. Alan. And, and so the funeral home that you prepaid at, you would find the next funeral home and they would make a transfer, okay? The money is always your money until the time of death. Now, cremation, another wonderful, you know, this, and this is something that just gets talked about a lot, a lot. I heard, Alan, can you give us a, a sense, you know, in, in percentage terms, versus 10 years ago, what percentage of folks now is the final disposition cremation versus, say, 10 years ago? I, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. It, there's a difference between the final, the final disposition being cremation and the entire funeral being cremation. Oh, and we're going to talk about that. Okay. About that. All right. But, but so, so maybe, maybe, at this point, maybe forty percent are direct cremation with no services. Yeah. Um, maybe a burial. Maybe not a burial. Yeah. Then. 60%, I guess, maybe would be some type of a funeral with cremation as the final disposition versus full earth burial. I see. I see. And if you were just comparing total cremations, right, to just a straight earth, you know, a burial of the remains, how, what percentage would you say is a straight burial of the remains versus some form of cremation? Ballpark. It's a lot, though. It's a lot. Yeah. it's a lot. And it's really, and it's kind of shifted. So we're going to talk about cremation for a little bit. And, okay, and can we just talk about that? Can you talk about the cost of cremation? And once again, as it relates to the total funeral, because I know that there is this, there is, you, I remember when we were talking about cremation, and I had in my head, so there's just, there's cremation, right? But then, as you pointed out, the question is, how does that fit into your funeral arrangements? It isn't like that's just kind of the one thing. Can you just talk about that a little bit? So, so cremation is the mode of disposition. That means that you're not buried, you're cremated. Right, those are the two and, possibilities. Dis disposition but, means what, what happens at the end, right? Right, So there right. are those two possibilities. So, but you can bury cremated remains. Right. So. Sometimes called cremains. I love that. Term. The cremains. <laughs> yes. Right. And so your question again is, no, um, not ashes. Not, not ashes. ashes. That's right. Not ashes. Not, not, That's not right. ashes. Yeah. That's right. Um, so just talk about how cremation fits into the the service. How you know how people how how different how different, possi well, different well, possibilities. Well, well, you can you can have what you call your traditional funeral, where you have visiting hours, um, some kind of a service and then the cremation takes place after the service. You can have cremation, then you can have your visiting hours with your service, or you can have cremation in the burial, or cremation in the scattering, or the cremation and nothing at all. So this cremation is just the mode of disposition. So cremation you, and nothing at all. Doesn't there have to be a scattering something? No. No. 
No, there was you just can you can leave then... them you can leave them at the funeral home, in the closet. Don't, don't, you can't leave them at the funeral. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, you, yes, you can. I mean, we have some. Yeah, we yeah, we have we do. Yeah, yes. it, some people just don't. And so after a while, you know, you just, you just give them a call and find out what what we're what going to do to. and, I, and I, whatever. I learned that I was actually reading the cremation statute, and there is actually a provision in the cremation statute that gives the funeral home direct to deal with this, you know, because you don't want funeral homes over time just being piles of unpicked up ashes, you know, or, or remains, remains, right, remains, right? Um, so, so it actually gives the, the funeral director the permission if, if no one has, has picked up the remains within a year, I think after date of death, to scatter them, and it directs every cemetery, every public cemetery, to have a place where ashes can be scattered. I never knew this, who knew, right? I don't know if that exists in Marlboro. I don't know, I haven't talked to the cemetery commissioners or anything. But th so there is actually a way to kind of deal with this, with this issue. So, so uh, what, a couple of other things, and then we're gonna take questions. A uh, cremation. So in order to be cremated, uh, you cannot be cremated until 48 hours after you died. Uh, and the medical examiner has to look at the body before it gets cremated. Right? We just want to make sure there's no monkey business going on. Right? So the medical, no, really. Because, you know, because what are you going to do? What, you can't uncremate them. Right? So there actually has to be a, a you know, something, some, a certification, right, by the medical examiner. Right? Before the, before the, the Board of Health authorizes, does the Board of Health need to authorize the cremation? No. 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 The Board of Health only has to authorize the, if the right, if if the if the if the if the if the grave is going to be opened mm -hmm. for the purpose of dr dropping in either remains or cremains, the board of health needs to give that permission. Is that am I, am I getting that part? The board of health has to give permission for any type of disposition. The board of health has to give permission for any type of disposition, inclu including cremation. Cre cremation and atomical disposition, or earth interment. Ah, and by anatomical disposition, you mean I gave my body to Harvard. Correct. So it's, it's going to be going to Harvard. Correct. I got it. So that's, that's, those, those are tidbits on cremation. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, ma'am, and then you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So, so your question is, as a theological versus as a legal matter, right, is there a right way to do this, right, to make sure that the soul, which we're going to talk about in a later presentation, doesn't end up going to hell? I mean, this is an important... <laughs> Right, because we wouldn't want that to be a tough way to go. Right here, you live a good life, and then you screw up the last piece, you're gone. Right, now you're in hell. What, what did I do wrong? Hold on for a sec. Okay, so the, the Catholic Church, their preference is that your body go to church and have your funeral mass, and then cremation, as long as you have earth interment of the cremated remains. They will allow cremated remains to come into church after you've been cremated, obviously, um, to have your funeral mass. And, but then you, you need to have the burial. So it can be before or after. But they would prefer before. So, th so her question was, do they allow the cremated remains down on the altar? Yes, they do. So, so your question is, when Frank got buried in the backyard, did the roses do better the next year? <laughs> That's kind of like the question. Alan, do we know this? I'm not a horticulturalist. We're, we're, we, we, know, we, we can find that out from a horticulturalist, but we're not sure on that one. Yes, yes ma'am? Yes. When they bring your ashes to the church up front, do they still have a mass after that? The, the answer, and the answer to that is yes. Now, and I think over here, and then we're going to come back. Yes, yes, sir. Well, uh, way in the back, and then you, ma'am, and then you, ma'am. Yes? So, so your question is, given the fact that you've read, you know, and we've all heard that the medical examiner is way backed up in terms of dealing with cause of death, have you heard of, have we heard of dispositions being delayed because of any of these issues? Okay, so that, those are on autopsy cases or medical legal cases at the ME's office. Um, at the crematory, they have a forensic person that comes from the ME's office to view the, uh, the remains for the cremation. So it's two separate entities. So no delays, no. Uh, although I would bet that the reason why there haven't been no, any delays is because in each one of those cases, the medical examiner, the ME, has said, there's nothing that looks suspicious here. If the medical examiner thought there was something that looked suspicious, absolutely there'd be a delay, right? They wouldn't allow the, 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 uh, the un until there had been an autopsy, right? Right? So yeah, yes, ma'am. 
So as a legal matter, can the remains go back to the family? Because Ellen had said that kind of as a Catholic matter, they'd prefer to have, they want to have the remains go into the ground. But as a legal matter, could the remains be given back to the family? Yes. So the legal matter, they can, they can just give you, it is legal for them to just give you back the remains. By the way, this question didn't get, come up at the last presentation, but so once I have the remains, so my poor wife has died now, and I, if, I've ha if I have the remains, is there any theoretical limitation on my use of the remains? I, I can do whatever I want with them. Okay. Okay. And uh, as I thought, yes, ma'am, I'm going to go there and then there and then there. Yes, ma'am. The question is, what is the cost? This is the, what is the cost of having a, a cremation? A, and I assume you're talking about a cremation without anything else, without, without any, nothing happening at the funeral home. You're getting cremated and then, and then you need to, by the way, then you're going to need to locate a, if you're going into the ground, you're going to need to you assume that you have a cemetery plot. So that, right? Okay. So what is the cost of cremation and, and, and putting it in the ground? For, from our funeral home, direct cremation, not including the cemetery charges, uh, $38.95. Okay. And then it, it would, then it would depend upon what cemetery, because every cemetery has a different opening fee. And, and, okay. and where does, do, do all of the, when you're doing cremations, do they all go to the same crematorium? Unless you request a different one. Unless you, and where is, where's the crematorium? I do uh, rural crematory in Worcester on Grove Street. Rural crematory in Worcester on Grove Street. Okay, yes, sir. So, so once again, in order, in order of magnitude terms, if there were, if there were, if there were really, if there were a showing and then a cremation and a service at the church and then, the, and then having the, having the remains in, in, a, in, a, in a grave as opposed to just giving them to you? Somewhere between six and eight thousand. Okay. So, it, and it's a legitimate question. So, if you have a service here and then the body is being shipped to someplace else for, for final disposition or burial in New Jersey, right? What, what is, is there a typical shipping cost for that? <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it, it depends whether you wanted to have it. Uh, uh, flown or driven in, in a time time factor uh. <laughs> and and it's and it's whatever the rate it, it, it's whatever the rate would be um, from the uh, airlines because they have you say again it, it would uh, We can't, we can't give you a figure, but if you want us to check, we'll, get you, we'll come back to you with a figure on that. Yes, ma'am. Last cremation question, then we're going to do some more stuff. Yes, ma'am. The question is, you want your children to have your ashes, and then you want them thrown into the ocean. Is that going to be okay? Now, by the way, I'm just going to say parenthetically that I had heard, I don't know if this is true, that there actually is a rule regarding the ocean. That, if that you can't put them within, this, well, there's some distance, isn't there? Hold on for a second. Yep. And maybe you need a DEP permit, and this could cost you some money. I, I don't know that. Hold on. And, and those um, would be under the Coast Guard regulations. So you would have to contact the Coast Guard because they, they determine. Okay. So if your kids want to, if, you, if your kids want to tell the Coast Guard before they go out, they're going to need a permit. Yes. The, so you, so you said there was actually a seminar on this issue of burial at sea, because there were a lot of people that really, really want. Yeah, that's that's like really popular. So, that's cremation. We talked about showings and other arrangements. I think we really kind of talked to that about that pretty thoroughly. Now we're going to talk a little bit about cemeteries, um, purchasing plots, and who owns them, and who can be buried where. Right. So briefly. Um, there is not, there is actually quite a bit of law on this. There are quite a few statutes on how all of this stuff works. Um, and, and, but it, so basically the way it works is if you want to purchase a, if you own a cemetery plot that has a given number of graves in it, right, then you uh, have the right to fill those graves with whoever you want while you're alive, right? Uh, and the way that you can sh you show the ownership of those graves according to the statute is that the cemetery commissioners are supposed to give you a deed. What that deed looks like, it doesn't say. They can make up their own deed. So every town can have their own, every cemetery can have their own, right? As to whether while you, being the owner of that deed, you have the ability to transfer that deed to anybody else, right? 
totally, it's my understanding, totally within the discretion of the cemetery commissioners. What you own when you own uh, a, a funeral, a, a, a lot, a plot at a cemetery is you have kind of like an easement, right? You have the right to put something in the ground there, right? And the right to, to take care of the top part and put stuff on the top part of that spot, subject always to the rules of the cemetery, right? So if, so, and those rules can change at any time. And they, are, and they are not bound by their original rules from when they originally sold you the funeral plot. So right, am I getting all of this right? Are we in agreement on this part? Now, after you die, where does that cemetery plot go, right? Well, it is my understanding, let's see if we agree with this, that you can will it, you can in your will um, transfer your cemetery plot to somebody else, right? If you don't, then your cemetery plot goes first to your spouse, right? And then to your children in no special order. And it is my understanding, and I keep looking over to them because I'm going through this and I'm really saying, of course, I've never had to do this. I was just reading it because I very seldom, this occasionally comes up, but I always try to duck the question before now, right? Now I actually kind of know, right? But the interesting piece is that no matter who you have transferred the, or through, if, if through your death or through your will, um, you can transfer your cemetery plots to somebody else, except if there's an available grave and your spouse dies, they get the right to be buried there, right? You cannot disinherit your husband, whom you never liked in the first place. <laughs> you know, you should have divorced him, because if he, if, he, if, he is, if he is your widow, he has the right to go next to you, right, in the, in the, in the plot. But once again, there is also nothing in the statute regarding what happens if there are kids that are arguing, and it sounds like it's just first come, first serve. So if you have a bunch, if you have three kids and two, and two plots, whoever dies first and second wins, right? And the last person doesn't go in, right? Um, I am also, uh, you, I think you were the one that told me, though, that all of these rules are subject to these opening permits. Can you talk a little bit about opening permits and the prices of opening permits? Not opening permits. The grave, the, the isn't that what Each, it's called, an opening, when you have to dig the hole and, and put the That's remains? it, there's an opening fee. There's an opening, opening fee. fee. Oh, I didn't so, mean a permit, I meant a fee. Fee, okay, How yes. How much is an op the opening fee? Well, it, it depends, again, which cemetery you're talking about. City cemetery, um, city opening. C c c Maplewood Cemetery. Maplewood Cemetery is a city cemetery. It is 600 on a weekday, 800 on a weekend, and 1,000 on a holiday. And more afternoon time. And more afternoon, and, and then there's additional charges afternoon time on a Saturday. <laughs> Catholic, Catholic Cemetery, St. Mary's and Immaculate Conception. 1250 is the opening. That's 1,250 on a weekday. Saturday, it's an additional four, no, I'm sorry an additional $400. Afternoon time, it's $150 every half hour. <laughs> and, then, and then they have what they call reuse charges. Reuse charges? Reuse charges. If you're getting better read again? So your mother and father died. Yeah. And, and they only had a two grave lot, and your sister now died, and she doesn't have anyone, and she's going to be cremated for them to have your, your sister interred with your parents. Yeah. You, they charge you $1,000 plus the opening, and if it was on a Saturday, the Saturday charge. Ah, but that actually relates to another question that I wanted you to bring up, which is, what about, how, does, how do cremains connect to all these things. So I bought, I bought a plot and it had four graves, four graves in which back in the old days there'd be four bodies, right? Mm -hmm. So now if I've got cremains instead of bodies, does that change anything? Yes. And how does it change? So the, the change would be at the city cemetery you could do one earth interment and mm -hmm. four cremations on each, on top of each of the four graves. So, so you can have an actual body down there, and then Unearth. four sets of cremains on top of the body. Yeah. So is you can do. Is that different from the from the the IC? Yes. And what is the rule there? The rule there is either one body or two cremated remains. 
So, so once again, this issue there, once you want, ask your cemetery, right? These, those issues vary completely by cemetery. There is no state rule or city rule or anything else, totally in the discretion of the cemetery commissioners, and they can change those rules. And I have been told that there is, for, for example, there is, there is one cemetery where if you've got extra graves, right? You had a plot, or you had a plot, four graves, and now you know you and your husband are going to be buried there, but, or you and your wife are going to be buried there, but your kids are all in San Diego. You know, they're not coming back. They're not going to be buried there, right? And so, so it's like, can you get a refund, right? Because you got two graves. And it's my understanding there are some cemeteries that you can transfer those graves back, and they'll even pay you, this is the one case I, I, I got, the cost that you originally paid. Correct. They won't, like, give you the current rate, no. right? And then they'll charge the current rate to somebody else. Yeah, yes, yes, ma'am. One question on this, and then we're going to talk a little about, about prepaids. Yes, ma'am. So, so, well, so you, so you said that you owned a grave, that, a, a plot that had several graves, and that you had two extras, and that they told you you could sell them. Could you sell them to anyone, or only to them? Right. So you could sell them to them. So you're basically selling them to them at the price you paid. There's a steep markup when they turn around and sell those again. I'll yes, yes. So just, just as an observation. Now, we want to talk a little bit about, we did that, and now we're going to talk about prepaids. So how does prepayment work? Alan, can we just kind of talk about that? Okay, so prepayment is, it, it would be just like if someone had, had died. You would come into the funeral home, you would give us all the basic information that we need, you would select the merchandise and services that you wanted us to perform for you. The money would go into a funeral trust account. The interest that is earned on the trust account would be used at the time of death to offset the costs. Some funeral homes will guarantee both the... Um, goods and services, and the outside expenses. Some will only guarantee the funeral home side, but not the outside expenses. And an example of an outside expenses? Um, cemetery, clergy, newspapers, um, clothing, certified copies of the death certificate. Because these are all out-of-pocket costs. Those are out-of-pocket costs that have no um, relationship to the funeral home at all. Okay, so now, and, and how can I make sure when I give you my big check prepaid, you're not gonna take the money? Well, because we have to put, that's Commonwealth of Massachusetts tells us, we have to put it into a, a, a trust account. The answer is because the money has to go into a trust, trust account. account. And it's my understanding that actually the, the, the Commonwealth gets to, they have, you have to report to the Commonwealth once a year. Yes. Here's where all the money is, right? right. Account by account. Yes. Here's the bank where it is, and the Commonwealth can check. This is actually, under, I think, the, the Department of Consumer Affairs. Correct. If I recall correctly, yes. monitors and, all that. Yes. Now, and, they, and they do come in to inspect. And they come the, to check the, the books. The records. Yeah. See, see if you got the big pile of money in the back. You still get all the money. Yeah. So now, so what happens if somebody? What happens if if somebody move, moves to the western part of the state? Uh, they would uh, go into the funeral home, mm -hmm. tell them that they have a pre 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 arrangement at yeah. the Slattery Funeral Home. They would contact us in writing. The family would have to contact us, us in writing as well um, and state that they will take the prearrangement funds and then we would notify the trust company and then they would move them to their facilities. So you're not locking yourself in to a particular funeral home by having made that payment. And now going back to the answer to your question, the price is good forever. That's the, the, the basically the way the system works is the, 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 fun the funeral home cannot touch the money until the services are provided. At that point, they get what you paid them plus the accrued interest, the interest that has occurred over time, right? But in return for that, they can't increase the price. The, the price is the price, right? Am I getting that right? Oh, yes. Only on, on our side, the outside expenses will vary will vary. So if the newspapers go up or you add to the newspapers, you need more certified copies, you've changed the church or the cemetery, that can fluctuate. So that side is not normally guaranteed. Right. But the, the, the funeral part, the, the, the showings, all of the stuff which are under his control are guaranteed. Those out-of-pocket costs to other players are not. Correct. 
you, you'd be notified by the funeral home, again, under the Commonwealth laws, you have to be notified and you find another funeral home and the funds will be transferred. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. The question is, the, is, the, is the pricing guaranteed if you're transferring? I would think even if you're transferring to an in-state funeral home. The, the, if, 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 if the Slattery's told you price X, and then you said, I really, and five years later, you want to go to a new funeral home, right? That the new funeral home is going to do that same price list, and they're going to give you price Y, right? This fund, he's, funds are going to get transferred, and you're going to pick up the difference. Unless, of course, the price went down, right? Um, I think that's the last question because it is 2 o'clock and, and we want to finish on time. I, if, I've asked the Slatteries to stay for a few minutes afterwards in case you have any particular questions. If not, thank you very much for, for your questions and interest and we'll see you in the fall. Yeah.